I'm presenting uh, art maps, and in this presentation, I will introduce you the objective of the project, the, um, the background, the challenges that we have been meeting in, uh, during its implementation, and the, how we address it, these uh, challenges through the um, development of a software platform. And we'll take also a quick look at a few screenshots from the platform, and then I will um, present the findings of two public engagement events that we organized last year and show you uh, current and future activities of the project. So ArtMaps is a collaboration between Horizon Digital Economy Research at the University of Nottingham, the Center for Intermedia at the University of Exeter, and Tate, three departments at Tate, at Tate, Tate Learning, Tate Online, and Tate Research. The um, objective of the project is to explore the relation between Tate artworks and the uh, location that they depict through the support of a web and a mobile application. And the project was supposed to be a one-year project. It was launched last year in January, but thanks to the promising results of the two public engagement events, as well as through uh, EPSRC award telling tales of engagement that the project won in October uh, 2012 at the Digital Future Conferences in Aberdeen, um, um, the project had an extension for another year. So it will run until the end of 2013. But what are the origins of the project? So Tate uh, currently holds uh, a collection of 70,000 artworks. Most of them are digitized, and most of them are, are available online for search and browse on the website, which was relaunched last year in, uh, in April 2012. And one third of this collection has been indexed with information about location. Usually, it's the site represented in the artwork. However, the information can be uh, quite specific in terms of latitude and longitude, exact coordinates of, for example, a building depicted in the artwork. But in many cases, this information can be quite, quite general uh, in terms of just referring to a city or to a region or other main geographical features. So um, the original idea from Tate was to map their collection as well as uh, to crowdsource geographic information, to crowdsource from the public more specific geographic information. But then uh, we realized that uh, mapping individual artwork is not such a simple task because it throws up many interesting questions, like um, how do we assign a location to an artwork, for example, or how do we map an artwork depicting a, a view with different landmarks? Uh, you can see a couple of examples up there on your uh, left uh, up. Uh, um, there is an artwork by William Marlowe called Capriccio, and you can see St. Paul Cathedral facing a Venetian canal. And this other artwork is by Turner, and um, it depicts three different towers, one from Salisbury, one from Oxford, and one from London. So um, a place, as it relates to an artwork, is not, um, has not a quantifiable attribute. As I said, you, we can uh, assign a quantifiable value to an artwork in terms of coordinates, but then this value doesn't answer to what is the relation between the artwork, what is depicted in the artwork, and the, and the location. And let's think about uh, a lake as well. How do we, a view of a lake, how do we locate this view in the lake uh, where the artist was standing? There are several questions arising about that. And then uh, in this process, state learning was also involved and um, they came up with other questions so about the personal relation that people have with the location uh, depicted in the artwork, the stories that they may know about the location, the content, additional content that they may contribute about um, the location depicted in the, in the artwork. So, 
from the initial idea, as I said, of mapping the collection and crowdsourcing geographic information, we decided to include also and to explore the, um, the relation, the personal relation that people may have between artwork and uh, depicted uh, location. And when we were developing the platform, um, as uh, I think Stuart said before, there are like uh, software development to crowdsource information. There is a lot of work uh, on that. So from our point of view, the challenge wasn't to develop a platform which is um, that's it, which just crowdsource uh, information, but the, the challenge was how do we capture uh, how do we capture people experience, how do we capture people content, and we thought about real life and everyday life in terms of how do we agree meaning, how do we convey meaning about yeah a location, what what is the location of this artwork? We we do that in real life through conversation, through dialogue, we negotiate meaning. So we thought to project this kind of process online, and usually online it's made through blogs, through yeah, comments. And so the decision was to develop a, a platform which on one side would allow to crowdsource geographic information, on the other side would allow to aggregate um, yeah, public contribution, let's say. And the difference between a, a classic Crowds, um, sorry, a classic blogging platform that we choose a, a blogging platform which is WordPress, but it was developed to be a kind of arena, a forum for discussion. But this discussion uh, are visualized there. You can uh, join the discussion there. But currently, what people upload is in their own space, so it's a kind really of. Um, forum where people go through their blogs, their own personal blog, and they can post, add content, and share comments. They can have a conversation, but the conversation is still, each opinion is still owned by the single person interacting with the platform. I don't know if it was, it's, it's clear the, the, the kind of architecture of the software platform, but Artmaps as a platform works as an aggregator of content which are still distributed in people owns blog. And uh, actually the art map system displays the Tate collection on a searchable map and uh, as I said is, uh, is based on the WordPress blogging platform and up to now people can interact with them with that just uh, through WordPress blog but we plan to further develop it. And uh, but we can take a quick look at it. So in view of this presentation, I searched, this is the current application, the, the current system. In view of this presentation, I searched for uh, Oxford in the, in the platform, and probably you cannot read. This is the first visualization that uh, you get when you search uh, a keyword or a location. And there are 150 artworks uh, located in the city of Oxford. From this view, from this distance, uh, usually artworks are grouped into clusters. But then when you get closer to it, um, or, um, yeah, artworks are more widespread and distributing in relation, of course, to their location. So in this screenshot, you can see, however, that uh, this is central Oxford, this is as much as close as we can get, and there are still 118 artworks in central Oxford. So I had a look to some of them, and of course they don't depict the same landmark, they don't depict the same site. So why do these artworks share the same location? Just because when they were indexed, they were indexed as Oxford, they were indexed as a general information about the city and not about what is depicted in the artwork. So the system where we mapped the, the artworks in the system, they were automatically placed in the central point of the city. That's why. So I went on and I uh, searched for Jesus College. I use it also to orientate myself because I don't know Oxford a lot. So. I, I look for Jesus College and I pick one of the artwork in the list. And this is a view uh, from Turner. It's called 
view of Exeter College, Old Saints Church from the turn. And then um, you can see when you choose an artwork, on one side you see the, the artwork, and on the other side you see the location which is attributed to the artwork. So I don't know how many of you know the city. I uh, use Google Map and Google Street View to understand it better. Anyway, the location is just next. This is Old Saints Church. And the location of the artwork is just next to it. But is, if you see the view uh, of Turner, the, the tower on the far background is Old Saints Church. So you can see that, yeah, probably this is not the right location, but this is not the right location from my point of view, of course. It's a personal view of it, because I thought I would provide a location which is where the artist was standing when he took the, the artwork, when he painted it. I would choose a different location. So I tried to suggest a different location for it. And what you can do in the, from a crowdsourcing point of view, that it's that you suggest a different location. So the original pin stays there the original location from the Tate collection, but then you can suggest one. And so, again, through the help, in my case, of Google Street View, because I don't know the city, I moved the pin up on, along Turl Street, up uh, northern, maybe, should be, and, uh, and then I confirmed that location. But as I said, uh, it's my view, because how can you um, locate this artwork? You can provide the coordinates of the building depicted, the different building. Or, as I decided to do, I would, do, I would place it in the place where I think that the artist was standing where he sketched it. Um, but it was quite easy with a view of a city, but if you are in a park, there are like so many works about the lake districts. How do you decide where the artist was standing when he depicted a lake? It's really hard to understand it. So as I, it was just a demonstration to show you that crowdsourcing geographic information about artworks is not just a simple task. So um, last year, in, uh, we organized two public engagement events um, to explore how people do interact with their environment through art and through the personal understanding of uh, art. So these two public engagement events took place in Tate Britain. One in April it was a two-day workshop involving people um, with an interest in uh, mobile uh, technology and uh, landscape. That was how it was um, advertised on Tate social media. And then uh, the other one in October was a one-day workshop targeted at families with children uh, who were recruited through the Tate Learning Family Program. So. The uh, uh, both events were organized were with indoor activities, but mostly with outdoor activities. So people, all the participants, were asked to wander around Tate Britain, in the area around Tate Britain. They were prompted with, um, I don't know, like uh, in the first case, in the first event, uh, via mobile, like uh, Tate facilitators would send them text saying, take a sound recording of that, or take a picture of the nearest landmark that you see, or some, this kind of prompts during the first day, while the second day was free for them to explore how they wanted on the basis of a thing they had to choose. In the second day, the family uh, went out and they were given like a paper map. They weren't given prompts by email like this of the area and they had some task to fulfill because they were with children. So for, for example, one of the tasks was take pictures of red <coughs> objects. So um, the technology during the first event, the technology art map system was an, at a very, very early, early stage of development. So we couldn't use it. Uh, so what we did was to explore the concept of uh, people relating location and art because we couldn't test the platform. So we used, uh, people used their own mobile phones to receive text from Tate facilitators as well as to upload contents. And we used a traditional blogging platform where they could upload their content. And we asked them to provide tags about the content they were 
uploading. Uh, 13 people participated and as I said, the first day was more ex mm, driven by TED facilitators, but while the second day was more self-directed. And the, they were video recorded, interviewed, and then uh, the, uh, all the audio recordings were transcribed and analyzed by the um, cross-disciplinary research group. And then the second event, the art maps went a mobile application. We're at an advanced stage of development so we could test them. So the family were provided each with two iPhones where we installed the art maps application. So they were given, as I said, this map with each had a different uh, landmark, a uh, different artwork, and which is around Tate Britain in London, and they had to search for it, and then through the application try to locate, to find the better location for that specific artwork. And while doing them, that, they were asked to yeah, take picture of red object, video recording, audio recording, and so on, to have a more complete experience of the uh, interaction with the environment. And some of uh, the findings of the engagement event is that, um, I mean, crowdsourcing geographic information, as I said, is not a simple task and can lead also through a wider uh, engagement of the public, which is not just say, okay, this artwork is here and here, can lead to a more a deeper engagement, a strong engagement by the people. So what happened is that artworks uh, from the digital collection as well, some of them went to visit Tate Britain, so artworks uh, worked as um, a stimuli for a new relation with the, with the environment. So for example, a couple during the first event, they saw um, a picture, I don't remember, an artwork, I don't remember which one, but it was like a, a wall with a, like a sort of, not swimming pool, but a pool of water. And so it, it inspired them to go out and they say, so we went around and we were looking for puddles of water. So we just started looking for splitting walls and concrete and doors and things like that. So we were looking at splitting the materials. So they were just wandering around Tate having a new relation with their environment, looking at different things because they were prompted by this image to look um, at the surrounding afresh. Another participant said, so in fact, it was a piece of work that influenced me and completely changed the way I was experiencing the city. So it was, he had an idea in mind, he went out, but then he looked while he was out, he had a prompt or maybe he just looked at the digital collection. And the piece of work took, took him in a complete new um, experience that he wasn't thinking before. On the other side, and I think that is very, very interesting for institutions and for um, exploring peripheral artworks, which are not uh, usually <coughs> visited online or offline by people, is that environment in that sense inspired people um, alternative exploration of the digital collection first, but then people were also uh, stimulate, stimulated to go to Tate Britain and search and look for the real, for the physical works. Anyway, it was mainly an online experience. So, um, like uh, another quote from a participant uh, saying, and as soon as I went out on my journey, I kind of looked on the floor and found this picture, a wedding picture, with the name Harvey put on the back of it and two people embracing in a kiss. And it was kind of tied in with a knot, like tying a knot as in getting married. So the whole journey continued on that path. And this person searched then the Tate collection and the art maps with keywords such as knot for example, just because she saw a picture on the floor that she reminded her about that. And that, of course, took her to explore the collection in a complete new way, which is not, is unexpected, I mean, from Tate facilitators and Tate learning people. So the experience that they live to go outdoor and be prompted about searching for art and locating um, uh, artworks um, result is, uh, resulted as a driver of novel conversations and social interaction. Um, one um, parent uh, quoted, I was surprised at how little we used the application, 
but how much it generated. I thought it would be much more engrossing for the children to be um, gazing at the screen all the time, but actually it took you outside of the digital world and to the world around you. And we talked about things we had never uh, talked about before. And I was um, in the second event, each family was followed by an observer, and I was observing this family especially. So I remember talking to, it was a mother with two children, and I remember talking to her, and she said, you know, I live near here, and we walk around here a lot, and we never talked about that, and they were talking about the sky because it was plenty of clouds, so she said, oh, it seems a turn of sky in that painting, or um, they were exactly given this map, which is, um, this artwork is a view from Tate Britain from the other side of the river, so they had to go on the other side of the river. Then they started to talk about the, how the river looked different and how the, there were commercial activities in, in the past on the river things. So it was really, really interesting. And what I found really interesting that is that the technology disappeared, which is quite important because, of course, as a parent, she was worried about that. And uh, as a researcher, I don't like technology getting too much into the experience of the people. Technology has to disappear, it has to be a natural tool like a pen. For we, we forget how to use a pen, we should forget how to use a mobile to interact with the environment or with the digital collection. And in fact, another uh, finding was that the motivation for using the mobile technology to relate art and location, it really changed from before to after the experience, because some of the people, like this mother, was thinking, well, sh would I do this experience? She was recruited, she participated to Tate uh, learning activities with her children, but she didn't understand the point of doing this experience. Anyway, she did because she was curious. And other people, these are all quotes from the first event, um, they, they didn't see uh, the value of the experience, of doing this experience before. They just did it because they were curious. And then after doing that, they all, not all, <laughs> but most of them, said that it was kind of, once it, it was, I was thinking that it was, it's a kind of shame that you need a workshop like this to trigger something to make you actually go out out there and explore and look at things afresh. And it's kind of ideally the way you should be living your life anyway. Quite poetic. If you could just peel off the layers of responsibility and commitment and the shortage of time. So another one said, but I don't get the opportunity to do it on my own. I have no reason to. I need a reason to do it. And so in a sense, if you can introduce the concept to people, whether it's kids or whether it's young adults, whether it's older people, they will be happy to do it as long as uh, it's um, a kind of a task base. There is a reason behind doing it. So anyway, the, the framing that Tate provided also had to uh, for the experience. But here you can see an example of what happened during the, the first two-day event. People in two days uploaded uh, 200 ob objects. Uh, among them, 94 pictures, 25 videos, 9 maps, 19 audio, and 34 textual files. And you can see on your left, top left, uh, one of the trails that the people undertook around Tate Britain. And down there, uh, there is another participant uh, who found the building she was looking for. And you can see the picture on, on the back. She thought she found. We are not sure it's the right one. <laughs> and then, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and then um, here there was another one. <laughs> Uh, interested in uh, in transport, so he explored the take collection to transport. He went to Clapham Clapham Station Junction and found uh, an old artwork and compared it to how it is today through his own picture on the in the in the middle. So this is part of the content people uploaded in the in the first event. So. Um, yeah, the second event was in October, and we found quite interesting also the, the idea not just about mapping the collection, but also the possibility to create art trails, 
in the collect through the collection because people were experiencing uh, physical but also mind trails. So we thought to, that it would be interesting to further develop the software to uh, allow people to create their own art trails when they decide to visit a city where there are a lot of artworks from Tate represented. So this is what we are currently doing and probably this new software development will be delivered lately in autumn and in connection with it um, we will do a commission to an artist uh, to design an art trail and to invite people to participate to an experience, an art driven experience. And then other activities that we will do, we will test the platform with schools, primary and secondary schools. We are taking contacts now. And uh, currently there are two art maps workstations that you can see here at uh, Tate Britain workstation. It means that you can go there and browse the, the, the application. And it's in connection with looking at the view exhibition. And in this case, we will uh, carry out an ethnographic study observing how people do interact with the platform. And we will interview a sample of uh, visitors. And then, because up to now, we mostly have been testing the platform in real settings. Real settings, I mean, people were physically at Tate. Uh, people are physically at, uh, in gallery interacting with the workstations. What we are going to do, also thanks to the award that I was uh, talking um, about before, telling tales of engagement, we are organizing four online events to uh, test the platform with the digital audience. So with no physical relation with the people, we are going to test how people are using the platform. And most of all, people will come from different areas that we don't know. So they will interact with their own location or with different location. And we will see how people are going to yeah, are going to interact with the, with the platform. And currently, the first event will be launched in two, three weeks. So if any of you may be interested in testing the platform and participating, just send me an email and I can provide you more information. But then uh, you find more information and you find also video about the two public engagement events. And you also find um, a blog about the difference between crowdsourcing uh, in digital humanities and crowdsourcing in, in as economic model on the um, blog. Uh, the art maps blog on the Tate website, and you find. But if you Google art maps and Tate, you will find it more easily than writing it down. And that was all. I don't know. Brilliant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just have a minute or two for questions. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is fascinating. some ideas kind of pop into my head. One of them is, um, have you considered using the GPS uh, tracking info that gets embedded into the images to connect people with uh, the artwork? And then second of all, um, there's um, some people have uh, treasure hunts they do in their cities yeah. where you have to find um, different uh, places. Uh, I'm not sure. Geocaching, kind of. Yeah, Actually, the, yeah. This, yeah. I'm not sure if you Yeah we, yeah, we thought about, we haven't come mm, to a conclusion about that, creating a uh, gamification. But then uh, up to now, there is like, basically, we are working a lot on the development of the platform. And on the other side, it's mainly acti Tate related activities. So they are mainly up to now. Uh, related to Tate learning program. So I think that in future is a good opportunity to try to do some gamification with this system for people to do treasure hunt. And about the GPS, they, um, I'm not a developer. So I'm on the engagement learning side of the project. But then I think that with the um, software development for the uh, creation of trails, it will be done so that people will be 
traced and they will be traced to GPS through the, during the trails. But I'm not sure. Quick question. Uh, is there a temptation for people to block these images on their own personal blog? And I was thinking that would be a problem because the tape's got a copyright on this, which says you're not allowed to, to block it. Uh-huh. Um, uh, you mean Tate images? No, the, the paintings. If you've got paintings on your you can say, oh, that's interesting painting. These, the paintings are on Tate, so we... Uh, if, I if I take this and, and, and block them on Facebook, yeah. haven't I got a problem then with my... You are allowed to blog it on your blog, but it's still a link. It's not that you're taking the image on your... All right, as long as I took the image, nobody does that. Sorry? I was thinking people would be tempted to take the image and actually block it. Um, I mean, they can do, but they actually s do, but it's a link to Tate. I do all the time. If you go to the Tate collection, I do uh, share my image on my Facebook and Twitter, but it's a link to Tate collection, so. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe I didn't get the question. Right, OK. I'm thinking if you take that image there. Yeah, this is a screenshot. And I put it onto my Facebook picture on my Facebook. And it's a commercial copy of the image. Yeah, but people, I mean, we cannot, I don't think that we can control that. Because, right. like, for example, in my presentation, because I know the copyright with Tate, I didn't want to get, these are all screenshots. So I can take a screenshot and use it. I cannot take a picture from Tate, download it, and use it. So, for example, the images that I used in my presentation are screenshots from Tate collection. Those are screenshots that um, I, uh, shared on Facebook and Twitter because the Tate system allowed that. Okay. No, maybe. I, I, I see your face is not happy. But well, maybe, no, no, no. maybe you can ask me later. I don't know if I am sorry. I just read the rules and it says you're not allowed to. It's you're not allowed to use the rules and give us Facebook. I'll show you the Tate. Uh, how I do, it's just automatic. I'm not, as I said, I'm not on the computer science of it, but the side of it. But I do, I, and we are not using those for commercial purposes. And people can, what they did, for example, they've been blogging. Um, the, I mean, they can comment on the image that it's on hosted on art maps. And then we, have, we work with Tate, so the, the image is from Tate. And people can blog on that image, and that image can be seen in their blog, but actually the picture is not taken to their blog. It's a link to the, uh, the, okay. the system. I know it's brilliant. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, uh, I think Lara will be around okay. all day, so yeah. if you have more questions, we will have an opportunity to catch her during the day. So for now, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. to introduce our next speaker, Kimberly Cowles, come from the British Library to talk about the Georeferencer project. I'm just going to bring up the presentation. It looks like you've got it open already. Oh, I do? Oh. More organised than I thought. Hello, thank you in advance for your attention. I'm going to try to distract you from hunger with beautiful images of British Library maps. Um, my name is Kimberly, and as curator of digital mapping at the British Library, I have an interest in digital geospatial data, uh, WYSI geographic tools, and scanned historic maps, all of which you see here. So uh, this, our recent crowdsourcing project for georeferencing historic maps is one of my favorite topics. Um, and from your point of view, I have good things to say about um, just the public's enthusiasm for crowdsourcing. I've been amazed, as well as uh, the possibilities that are out there now. Um, things moved quite quickly on this, and although it is a very small project, um, I've been enthused and amazed by it, and I feel really lucky to be in the position I am. So as you all are experts on crowdsourcing, um, I won't bore you too much with the details of 
the project itself, but rather I'd like to address some of the research questions that have come up. Um, Stuart Dunn in particular mentioned some of these, so I'm going to try to integrate them into my description of the project. First of all, with communities, um, I want to just basically relate uh, who was using our tool and how they were using it and what, what effect that has on other crowdsourcing research on this. Quality assurance is something I'm asked about every time I speak. Um, in particular, I am a librarian, in particular by librarians and archivists. So um, this is one of the major parts of the georeferencing project that changed over time, as is motivation. Uh, I realized we were completely wrong at the beginning about what motivates people. Again, it's more good news. Um, and I'm going to tell you all about that. And lastly, the in, in impact on the British Library, on the institution. So what I've seen at the British Library, how we've responded to it, um, and that may be something that is open to debate. There is one other British Library person here, so we may have to argue about it afterwards. So a snapshot of what's happened so far. We released maps to the public for georeferencing according to stages. So um, starting in February last year, we released a relatively small group of maps um, out to the public. And um, as you can see, they were done in six days and with, by 90 participants. So it's a small scale project, but it was done very quickly. And in response, we continued with other phases. Um, the next one was later that year, uh, of a similar size, um, more participants, about 30% more, and most recently, uh, a few months ago, the third phase was completed. And this graph there at the bottom is basically meant to illustrate the staged process. It's not an ongoing um, crowdsourcing like some of these others that have a huge lot of content for the public to deal with. Rather, it's kind of been sent out in spurts, and that's been because, actually, before phase one, um, I thought those 725 maps may last um, a year, even. <laughs> so what did I have the public do? Um, the British Library has 4.5 million maps, paper maps, that is. Um, and some of them are in this condition, meaning they've been scanned. Um, they're digital images now, JPEGs, TIFFs, and they basically are that, like a photograph of you or me, um, with no information about where that map is located. So what georeferencing does is assigns geospatial metadata so that points on the map can be associated with particular points on the Earth. And that allows a great degree of flexibility. Um, in this case, it's been overlaid on Google Earth for visualization. And this is um, my very favorite overlay. And so I show it every time I show someone georeferencer. And um, the reason for that is, is it so nicely illustrates uh, not just the beauty of maps. This is a hand-drawn watercolor map, but also um, how quickly it can impart landscape change and other information about places. So I was hoping to have a little um, uh, excuse me, a pointer, but um, I think I can describe fairly well what you're probably observing right now is that in 1801, the area of Exeter was pretty much the same structure that it is now. It's just all been filled in. Um, if you look across, uh, across the course of the map at the major streets, the roads were already in place, um, the river is obviously there, and even field boundaries, if I could go through and change the opacity, which I could if, if I wasn't using a slide, um, you would see very clearly even the field boundaries are still respected and are now you know, developments and streets. Uh, the, the major exceptions being the, the railway going across the upper right and the superhighway in the, in the lower left. But it's, it's this kind of experience that 
I, I think, really lent to this project for public work. Um, so in addition to pretty visualizations, um, collecting geospatial metadata also allows us to visualize the data in more standard ways, like using Google Maps. Um, and it allows uh, more advanced analyses of data. Um, from the library's point of view, from the map library's point of view, um, finding the most intuitive way to find maps is using a map. So what I want to do is capture this geospatial metadata so that our search tools can then um, be expanded, like um, in this JISC project, Old Maps Online. So this is one of the outputs of the British Library Georeferencer project. Um, the geospatial metadata, sure, we're using Google Maps um, to sh within our project web pages, but we've also exported the data that was collected so that it can be searched using these geographic means online. Old Maps Online is a portal for map libraries throughout the world. And you can see that um, unlike just uh, tags, which refer to a single point on the planet, um, it actually is giving the outlines of the maps, the complete geographic coverage. So georeferencing, back when I was in grad school, um, georeferencing required uh, complex systems called GIS, geographic information systems, and leaning over a table with a digitization tablet. But in the last five, 10 years, online tools have developed so that uh, georeferencing can be accomplished just using an eyeballing technique as you see here. So with the historic map on the left and the modern map on the right, um, anyone can go through, compare points, and associate them, as you see here. Um, this particular georeferencing tool was developed by Clock and Technologies. And it was this technology that was selected by the British Library to be customized for its georeferencer project. So um, this is the tool having been customized. And you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the historic map has been zoomed into sufficiently so as to read the place names. And on the left is just your regular dynamic online mapping. Um, it has a gazetteer at the top, just like everyone is used to, and, and the usual kind of um, zooming and panning, as well as changing base layers, if someone prefers OpenStreetMap to Google Maps to satellite imagery. Um, once points are assigned, and like in the last graphic, um, just by looking for common features, such as the meaning of a river and road, um, town names, and other kinds of intersections. It's fairly easy to go back and forth, assigning, you know, five, five, six, six, and so on. Um, when the user clicks save, it then immediately takes them to the visualize module of the georeferencer. And um, essentially, it's the map that's just been georeferenced overlaid on either a map or, in this case, Google Earth imagery. Um, you can see this. This is an 18th century map of part of London that has been, obviously, North wasn't at the top, so it's been turned. Um, and it matches fairly well with the river, even though there'll be s some bits that are off. You can see that the roads match up very well. Um, and for someone who's interested in the area, this is, of, um, this is something that can be played with for a long time. Once visualizing it, one can go back to georeference and add extra points and make it perfect. Uh, or move on to georeference another map, whichever they prefer. Another feature is downloading the map in Google Earth so then it can then be combined with other data, other maps that the user may have. Um, this is another personal favorite of mine to show. It's a 20th century map, um, but obviously it, the change is more similar to the Exeter map that we just saw as um, fields and empty spaces have been filled in with urban development.
So once the maps have been geo-referenced, um, they then receive this button in our online gallery that takes users immediately to the overlay. So essentially, uh, when someone finds a map in Google in the online gallery that they're interested in, they then benefit from the visualization that has been created, and they can also go in and geo-reference a little bit more. We used uh, the usual kind of competitive crowdsourcing tools to encourage people to contribute to GeoReferencer. Um, we have our top five contributors uh, listed. There's been a lot of back and forth, I realize, in the crowdsourcing community about the value of competition. But um, I found it's different strokes for different folks. Um, some people really, really liked this. Um, other little widgets that are embedded within are, again, individuals' contributions um, pitted against one another, as well as the more communally interested work to be done, the progress of the overall pilot. Some people wanted to have particular maps that they had worked on associated with themselves. So the usernames were also included in the metadata for this display. So this web page is simply just a project website. And um, this metadata is there now. But actually, what we're really getting, this geospatial metadata, um, is all underneath it. And, and that kind of metadata isn't going to be kept. So I mentioned we started out with straightforward competition to get people to do stuff. Um, I offered a prize to the top contributor during phase one, which now seems to me just laughable. Um, they, the top contributor was invited to come to the British Library map collections. Um, and when I invited him, he said, oh, can I invite the other top contributors? Um, and it just kind of showed me he was interested in the communal side of it. He wanted to meet the others, um, and it happened every single person um, did come on that same day to the British Library. And um, we had a grand time. But I did think initially, oh, I'm going to have to offer something at the end of this. Uh, again, kind of sticking with that kind of race analogy, um, the project, the telling points was limited to when the competition was live. So once all the maps were georeferenced, so after that week was over, then all those widgets that you saw went away. Um, and lastly, I awarded points by the number of maps that were completed. So again, I, it, I had this naive view that, oh, I got to, I've got to make sure that the work is done, that these maps are georeferenced. Um, so instead of going for quality, which would be measuring uh, or telling points by the number, the amount of data that's entered, I did it by the number of maps, kind of encouraging participants to do a minimum of work in a way. Um, and so for phases two and three, since October last year, um, I've kept the um, competitive tally widgets going throughout. Um, I haven't offered a prize. <laughs> although I have acknowledged the top contributor at the end of each session. And um, I've tried to go, go for the goals, and um, folks are rack up points by the number of points they enter, because I've realized these maps are going to get geo-referenced. Um, I want to get more data as opposed to um, more maps done faster. So what I hadn't realized in phase one is that folks aren't really interested in doing the minimum. Um, you'll see 20% of people did minimum number of points, three to five points. Um, but most people did, uh, contributed much more than they had to. And about 20% um, contributed an outrageous amount of points, suggesting to me that I, it was the activity itself that uh, was the motivation not um, these competitive crowdsourcing tools. Um, here's a map that someone added 266 points to. <laughs> so it could be argued that 
um, oh, this is a waste of time, there's no need to have so many points, that's true, there's no need to have so many points, except that this person obviously enjoyed doing this, and they were able to engage with this map um, in that way. I happen to know that the person who did this is a local historian. <laughs> so someone like that um, is interested in making it, the visualization fit perfectly. Um, I mentioned that in phase one, the idea of having a, a live period and then a dead period um, became irrelevant. And that's because people continued georeferencing the maps even after it, it, there was no competition in it. There was no chance uh, of getting top points or anything like that. Um, so these, this graph basically shows um, that for all the maps that were digitized. Um, in phase one, 40% of them have been edited since. For some reason, phase two is less popular, with 18%. And my most recent phase, nearly half of them continue to be edited. Um, it just kind of shows that this kind of ongoing working on these things, on these maps, and the process of doing it, tends to be of more interest than um, finishing things, gaining points. Um, it seems to be an enjoyment of the process. Stewart and others have defined humanities crowdsourcing projects as involving answering research questions. Um, so not strictly mechanical tasks, but rather, um, what did you call it, investigatory tasks. Um, and that's what a lot of the maps in GeoReferencer were. So they required research online in order to figure out how to place the points. And this is one example of a 1600 map. Uh, ignore that one, 66. Um, first of all, the place names, the place name has changed. Um, this is Shropshire, um, what used to be called Salop. North is not at the top. And um, you might need to have some kind of knowledge of mapping at the time and scale, because you can see that um, around Shrewsbury, uh, suddenly this, the scale is quite large. When it, as you move out, outwards, it becomes a smaller scale map. Um, so this kind of work, as well as even later maps, this is a 19th century map, just don't even necessarily have enough information to georeference on their own and require outside knowledge. Um, this one, this, this was actually a very interesting one because uh, the participant added a comment explaining how she found the information and she elucidated the system for mapping at the time, um, saying that the uh, lamppost were at regular intervals and that she knew that the next sheet was in a certain place. Um, so it's true, she was from the Royal Geographical Society, but, <laughs> but I was amazed at the, amount, the curiosity and the amount of knowledge out there. Not all of them required research. Um, the phase three group of maps um, included more modern materials and materials from worldwide places. So I had thought that maybe there'd be less interest being more familiar, but actually this was the, the most popular uh, phase. And you can see that they are fairly, these maps have been created according to scientific modern day standards. But nevertheless, um, just as important that we be able to find them. Um, I mentioned the staged process, and another effect of offering maps in batches in terms of communities is that we didn't have one single united community throughout the entire last year. Um, by working in spurts, it tended that we'd get new people with each spurt, and not necessarily um, the, the folks before that. So it's tempting to think the contributors are going to be all the people before plus anyone after. But in actual fact, it was completely unpredictable. Um, people dipped in and out 
and um, the crowd changed quite a bit. I put a few statistics here. Um, just to give you an idea, things that just surprised me. Nine out of the 14 top participants from phases one and two did not contribute at all in phase three, much to my disappointment. Um, I tried to uh, look at this as a community, and I stayed in touch with the people who contributed in previous um, phases, but it turns out they had moved on, or I don't know what, it, it, but it was a renewable resource I found. Ignore that statistic, it should say, what, 66. Um, I now found that to be generally true in all of them, all of the phases. And the person who has contributed the third highest points, he only started a month or two ago. This is someone who's just been focusing, um, working on it almost every day. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you never know. And my one constant is uh, my very top contributor who's come out ahead in every single phase. Um, and he's, he actually started before the first phase was released. Um, he found out through Twitter. And he's been regularly updating maps, so I'm not sure I hold out a lot of hope for any <coughs> contenders for his title, but um, he's been amazing. Uh, I mentioned how unpredictable it was. Um, 8,560 points added in the last five days by five volunteers. Um, who would, there, there hasn't been, um, I guess I receive all the web analytics associated with the project, and it's not as though there's been a, a huge publicity push or any huge effort lately. It's just that some of the folks that um, got started during phase three have just continued even though we've, all the new maps were used up after four days, but they just keep on working. And that leads me to my ideas about quality assurance. In phase one, I had thought that I would need to um, have someone manually make corrections in order to prepare data, in order to correct any mistakes. And I found by keeping the materials open and its uh, meaning available to georeference has meant that some volunteer, new volunteers just make any corrections when there are errors in the data. So as the last phase was released, I'd go in periodically and see what maps had been georeferenced. And I did see some major problems, like, oh, that's Afghanistan, not Norway. And <laughs> I've thought, oh, I hope you know, that I'm not getting a, a lot of inaccurate data. But those errors and problems seem to just go away. Um, users do go in and, and make corrections without any kind of push or prodding. I thought I might need to you know, ask them to correct the, the materials that had errors, which um, there is an automatic calculation of RMS errors that gives a, a vague sense of um, the geometric correctness of the georeferencing. But that completely unnecessary. Um, being from the British Library, however, uh, I do want to use this metadata in the library's catalogs. So uh, the catalog at the British Library is um, sacred. And no matter how, how much I think I'm sure that the data might be correct, um, it, it won't be added into the catalog until it goes through yet another more formal process. And that's going to be a reviewer module. Um, so that's being developed now. and. In this way, actually, I'm hoping to keep contributors involved, in particular my top contributors, by asking them to look at each map and giving a seal of approval. Basically, just having a glance, make sure it's in the, the right place, that, it, that the coverage is, is representative, because the geospatial metadata that will be put in the catalog will be the four corner points. Um, and, and then the maps will be closed, so no further edits can be made, and that can be pushed on. The impact on the British Library. 
Um, and these, this is just my own opinion, and I don't represent the British Library in anything I say. Um, but geospatial metadata is becoming recognized and acceptable, not necessarily as a direct result of this project, but curators have become familiar with what it is, and we will be including it in catalog records for maps from now going forward. Um, there are more crowdsourcing projects planned, or there's more talk of it, there are more ideas being passed around. Um, Right now, there are several going on. Uh, one is to geotag photographs, similar to some of the projects earlier today. Um, Sharon, you mentioned a transcription project, which is like some of the projects later today. Um, but it's, it's, going, it's making the rounds. It's being talked about, um, especially because it, it, uh, it does seem exciting, and what well, is exciting. And to the higher-ups at the British Library, there has been a huge increase in the web traffic. One of our goals, of course, is to make collection items available to the public, um, have a reason for us digitizing material and putting them online. And we do have the statistics quite easily for that to say, before the British Library georeferencer, this number of people looked at these maps. After, look, you know, it's five, ten times as much. Um, from my point of view, uh, many of these scanned maps, which have been considered copyright British Library, um, have really needed to be opened up, and that has been accomplished for some of them. Um, the Ordnance Surveyor's drawings, which is I showed the map I showed, the detail of a map. Uh, of Exeter that I showed earlier is one of that, the series of Ordnance Surveyor's drawings. Um, and these are very detailed maps of England, or the south middle and south of England and all of Wales that cover a period of time during which there wasn't, there just wasn't consistent mapping at this scale. So this is the earliest record of many of, of these parts of the landscape and as a result, are, have always been in demand by researchers. Um, these, I, the statistics I have up there, larger projects, um, this has been so um, encouraging that these drawings have been opened up to the public. So that means that they're being made available under an open government license and supplied free of charge. And I like to think that the demonstration of public interest and demand contributed to that decision. Okay. Um, so the future of this project, I've got a load of maps that have just been scanned. And these are another really in-demand um, group of materials in demand by the public, by genealogists, by historians, because they map uh, such a large scale. <laughs> they, they, map, they were created for British towns. There are fire insurance plans for US towns. Um, and actually, there are, Goad also created similar maps for uh, British interests worldwide. But they provide unique information in that they give many of the land, many of the individual uh, businesses, um, land use, um, building materials, footprints, and they have addresses on them. So at the moment, uh, anyone who wants to see these, of course, has to come into the British Library's reading rooms and um, look at a paper index and then call up the volumes. And by scanning these um, and having them georeferenced, they'll be accessible online to a greater public and searchable geographically eventually. I'm also piggybacking on other projects, um, including the World War I Europeana project that's already been mentioned. So whenever maps are scanned for other purposes at the British Library, I go ahead and say, Will you give me a copy and we'll put them online and it'll be great for your project too. 
So the World War I maps that are being put up next year will be made available to the public for georeferencing as well. And thank you very much. Um, my email is there. I am also georeferencer at vl.uk. But um, I, I think you've gotten the message that we've met with tremendous success with crowdsourcing and with maps, and I've had a great time, and I encourage anyone who's going to take up a project like this. Thanks very much. Thank you.